Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Into the Storm. We have a special guest here, the Golden Rule winner last week for North & Co. I might just be doing this, for basically, and have the, every Golden Rule winner come on the week after. Yeah. Uh, but a friend of mine and a, a very successful young guy, and uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on here was to talk about the journey to, into all the different facets of what you do in your life because there have been a lot of successful things coming from you from an early age from from fitness to business right um so we have reed simpson here he is a um team lead um at north and co uh what's the name of your of your specific is golf house our golf team property? is golfcoursehomes.com golf course golf course homes.com um, so Reed's a young man, he's 30 years old. And, uh, the reason why I say golden ruler, golden rule, ruler, golden ruler award is, uh, every week, obviously, or I'm sorry, every month at North and co they, they, not, they announced a new person and he won it last week. And I think it was an opportunity for a lot of people to, to learn more about you. And sure. we had just talked like an hour before. Yep. So I had already kind of pre-learned this stuff and, and I already kind of knew some things as well. But before we get into all that, let's just start a little bit about, you know, where you're from and, and, and that sort of stuff, like how you got to, how you got to Arizona. Yeah. Well, appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Um, I was born and raised in Vancouver, BC. Um, and I decided to move to Scottsdale, Arizona in 2008 when I was 15 and I was, uh, raised primarily by my mom and stepdad. And then my dad and stepmom lived in Scottsdale. My dad was a real estate developer and things shifted, of course, in 2008. So it was a very interesting time for me to not only be introduced to the United States, but to also take an interest in what he was doing, go to his office after school on the weekends during the summer. Um, but I had a keen interest in doing internships. So I interned um, with my dad, my dad's financial planner, um, and a various uh, other people in different industries, uh, from logistics to software development. Um, and I went on from Scottsdale Christian Academy to Grand Canyon University, um, playing golf and uh, taking that as far as I could, but realizing I would be much better served golfing for business than golfing as my business. Right. Um, so how, how good of a golfer did you get? My best was a plus two. So I would shoot in the high sixties, Okay. but, um, you know, I just came from spectating a golf professional golf tournament earlier today because we have some relationships and partnerships with golf course homes mm -hmm. and they're shooting in the low sixties. Right. It's and insane. If there might be one day, one round where you shoot the same, but professional golf tournaments are over four days. Yeah. So if there's a six to eight shot difference across four days, it's like, wow, I lost by 20. Let me ask you a personal question then. So how did your mom take it? You leave in Vancouver at 15 to come now live with your dad in Scottsdale. It was very tough. Um, there's, levels and layers to that mm -hmm. answer as well. Um, my mom and stepdad were very stable, um, faith-based home. My mom's always been an entrepreneur. Uh, she runs a marketing agency at that time. She was even running that of, you know, 10, 11 people, um, mm -hmm. out of a 6,000 square foot rental house that she had, Wow, which was a cool, yeah. uh, you know, nine to four o'clock there was employees there but there right. was just desks kind of scattered <laughs> right, yeah. through the house um but it was a very you know calm peaceful suburb of vancouver about thirty thousand people um called tawasson it's where the boat takes you from vancouver to victoria okay vancouver island so right on the pacific ocean it was gorgeous um i was a junior member at a private golf club um it was a you know picture perfect upbringing um, and you know, on my father's side, it was, you know, more tumultuous. Um, so it was knowingly like into the storm, right? but you knew that before you came here, I knew all of that, Okay. but, uh, you know, taking on those costs and those challenges for being able to come to the U S and I feel like a lot of Americans view Canada as an extension, America's hat, 
Yeah. Whatever. Um, I've never heard that, by the way, America's hat, uh, but that's go. good. Yeah. <laughs> but, but they do, right? Yeah. And, and, and the best way to explain it is Canadians live in a Canadian and American life. Mm-hmm. 90% of Canadians live within 100 miles of the border. Um, sometimes people go to the U.S. as their primary place to get groceries, to get gas, to shop. Mm-hmm. Um, we're always buying from e-commerce stores that are based in the U S shipping to Canada, paying for shipping, paying for, you know, duty. Yeah. Um, so there isn't really a pathway other than coming down here and getting employed, um, and having your employer write a letter that you're the only person on the planet that can fill this job. Right. Um, coming down here and, um, being an entrepreneur, there is an entrepreneurial visa, but it's, it's challenging. You kind really? of, you kind of always have boxes to check. How much are you investing in the States? How many Americans are you employing? Um, and then the option that I obviously didn't know would be mine, but I did end up marrying an American. Mm-hmm. It wasn't my grand plan, but, <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> um, I came down here last two years of high school, all of college, Um, and then I was, I got married, um, and we had been dating for quite some time. Um, but, uh, coming down to the States, it's, it was, it was such an opportunity that I knew I needed to strike. Um, so I knew. Do a lot of kids your age or did a lot of kids your age at that time know that that's like, eventually that's like the plan Like we got to figure out how to get to America so we can get a real job or do people just stick or stick around and. You know. A lot of people stick around. There's a lot of trades in Canada. Yeah. There's a lot of oil and gas industry. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of engineering. There's, um, you know, professional careers. Um, to me, it didn't, it doesn't have the heartbeat of the U S it doesn't have the, you know, I met some guys that have a golf vlog and, you know, make considerable amount of money on YouTube. I know people that, you know, the good, good guys or yeah, uh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I love met, those young men. I met, uh, just <clears throat> a ton of clients that have all these different ways of approaching the world and their business mm-hmm. and just the excitement and the passion. I would say Canada has a little bit more relax toned down approach yeah. to business. Um, you know, they, they are very outdoorsy. So there's that you know, Mm -hmm. nice lifestyle aspect, but, um, I was keenly interested in let's be a part of the biggest economy in the world. So when you moved in with your dad and how long had it been since you'd like, was it like a culture shock for you to be in here into Scottsdale is one thing going to Scottsdale Christian, but also moving into a home with your father, which you hadn't lived with for a while and having to adjust to that, them having to adjust to you. Did they have any other kids? I'd never lived with my dad. Oh, you didn't? Uh, no. Um, he separated uh, from my mom, you know, shortly after my birth. So I have no memory of them together. Um, I only know two times when they've been in the same room together, once at high school graduation, once at my wedding. Um, so it was totally different. He married a, a woman from Mexico City, um, and they had two other kids. Um, so I was moving from being the youngest in Canada um, with your mom and stepdad to the oldest by 10 years. And uh, with with dad and stepmom that weren't used to being my parents at all. Yeah, so you kind of raised yourself at that point when from your last two years of high school? Yep, and uh, helped with with the younger kids, 10 years and 13 years younger than me. Um, Wow. And uh, yeah. Do you have a relationship with them now? I do. Okay, cool. And the young ones are obviously, what, in their 20s now or late teens? Uh, Yeah, 20 and late teens. Wow. That's crazy. So Trey went to school in Canada. I went in Toronto. Nice. Yeah. What was the name of the school? Toronto Film School. Yeah, Toronto Film School. Do you want to know a fun fact? Sure. And you can sound educated when speaking to Canadians. Don't pronounce the second T. It's Toronto. 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 Yeah. I've also heard that it's not Canada either. It's Canada. <laughs> you, know, you know who says that? Uh, um, God, what's his name? Shit, we'll get back to that. I just saw that the other day and he was like, please do not pronounce it. I was like, dude, that's the first time I've ever heard that. And I know enough Canadians to say that that doesn't seem right. Um, okay, so coming out of high school, you're like, all right, I'm good enough to play golf. 
So I'm going to go to GCU, mm -hmm. play on the golf team. Former Maryville uh, golf club. Yes. <laughs> yes. Renovated. Yeah, renovated. I used to call it, it's like the baby Papago. Yeah. Um, it's got the same sort of big you know, eucalyptus trees, and you know, it gets tough if you get on you get behind one of those things. But it's a nice track. It's, it, they've done a great with it, right? Yep. Location can still be a little dangerous. Yep. Still a, be a little. <laughs> yeah. That's a good analogy. Yeah, they call those golf courses Papago and GCU. They call them core golf courses. So they're in the town core. Homes are right around the perimeter of the course, but there's yeah. no courses inside of the course. Just like Arizona Country Club. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. So after golf, you decided, right, I'm just going to go to work. Yep. And But one of the things that I think that people should know is that you're also a runner. Yep. Right? So you weren't a competitive runner in high school, or were you? I was not at the, you know... Mm -hmm. trying to go to the Olympics right, or right. trying to get a college scholarship level because golf was the primary focus. But I was running. I'd done marathons before. You know, I'd done right. uh, a bunch of a different events. Um, I made it a goal to complete the Ironman triathlon before I graduated college, which I did. Um, I did that in November 2013 here in Arizona. Um, what, so let's back up, though. Like, What makes a kid that young – like what made you so like driven to want to do this sort of stuff? Like even a kid that's, you know, if you were before you graduated college, you'd already ran marathons and running wasn't your thing necessarily. It was a golf. Did you have somebody in your life that was a runner that like got you into this? Like how did yeah. this happen? Yeah. My mom, okay. my mom ran every day, um, in our, you know, suburb town and she ran with my best friend's mom. Okay. Um, so we were raised around that. We used to ride our bikes with them when we were younger, alongside them when they were running. Then we would run as a family. Um, and I loved it. Um, I feel like I had a bit of a natural gift for it, even back in elementary school, just running around the track. Yeah. Um, Was it when, do you think? Like you just had like the air to just be able to keep going? Yeah, yeah. Um, some people are just blessed with that. As well. Yeah, I would say I would I would much rather a longer run than a, a sprint. Yeah. So slow twitch muscle, um, and uh, I really fell in love with the uh, the training aspect, which lasts months. I think improves a lot of other areas of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and then also when things get really tough when you're running, just the mind body connection. Yeah. Um, it's really powerful to seemingly break through what you were trying to hold yourself back right. on but you know you're you're forcing yourself to continue so some of my friends say the reason why i love running so much is because it just feels so good when you stop running right <laughs> yeah. you don't actually like running. Yeah, right right <laughs> uh, but there's some beautiful days where you i mean there isn't that there's that runner's high yeah. people get i mean yeah. no people get emotional too it's like you yeah. you know you can You've heard, I've known plenty of people that have cried whether they're running or running or finishing yeah. races or, you know, trail running, that sort of stuff. Um, so for everybody who doesn't know what an Ironman is, I'm, I'm sure everybody's heard of it, yep. but like, what are the actual like, s s like specs on that? Yep. So it starts with a 2.4 mile swim. Um, it's dark when you jump in, you are wearing a wetsuit. That's what scares most people. Um, even people thinking about attempting to complete an Ironman, the first thing they typically say is, well, I'm not strong in the swim. Mm -hmm. And while that sounds daunting, 2.4 mile swim, it's actually by far the easiest. Um, Part you just of it, need yeah. to learn the technique. You need to learn how to swim for distance. Mm -hmm. um, so to give some rough numbers and my times associated with each one of them, that took me about an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. Um, there's buoys, there's people in kayaks, there's people on jet skis, there's 3000 swimmers all starting right. at the same time. Um, it's a very exciting. And that's moment. the scary part, right? Where people feel like they're going to get like, they're like getting hit yeah. and you could drown and yes. but no one really ever does. Yeah. And there's a lot of techniques <laughs> to the swimming that you will want to learn if yeah. you're getting into it. Um, the next step is a 112 mile bike. Um, it's about the distance from Phoenix to Flagstaff. Um, so you are on that bike seat for a long time. Um, That's got to be brutal, dude. Yeah. Especially with you were 145 pounds when you did it. So you probably had no ass. You know, it's like, you know, it's, it's having that seat. Yeah. It's kind of brutal. Yeah. 
and you should look up some <laughs> pictures of triathlon bike seats. They're not much of a seat. Right. It's like yeah. a little skinny little thing, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was just under six hours for me. So that's a real mental challenge right there. Um, and you're on the bike. And for the Arizona Ironman, you go from Tempe Town Lake to the top of the B-Line 87 Highway uh, in the far, far corner of Fountain Hills and back to Tempe Town Lake. That is one lap. And you have to do three laps. Um, Damn. So you are very excited when you're coming back <laughs> down the hill on your third lap. And you just want off the bike. You yeah. just don't want to see a bike ever again. <laughs> uh, you get rid of your bike and you put on your running shoes and you run a full marathon. So 26.2 miles. Um, that took me right around four hours. Um, my whole Ironman, my time was right around 11 hours and 20 minutes. Um, that is a competitive range. Um, breaking 12 hours, I would say is kind of like par for okay. Iron Man. So breaking 12 hours is a goal for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, 17 hours is the absolute cutoff. Every Iron Man in the world starts at 7 a.m. and you have to finish by midnight. Mm -hmm. Um, Damn. so, uh, but it's inspiring. If you want to go attend an Iron Man, the most inspiring time to go is at 1130 to midnight at the finish line because it's body types that you wouldn't think are right. Ironman athletes. Yeah. And everyone is pulling them to get to the finish. They call them sweepers and they'll actually send people out onto the course to encourage them to help, help them and try yeah. and get their time. Oh, I'm sure that's massively yeah. emotional. Oh, it's incredible. I mean, lots of crying going on oh, at yeah. that point. Right. <laughs> so that, that's a, that's a full day. Um, that's an event there. And, and you've done one. I've done one and I've done two half Ironmans as well. Okay. There's an abbreviated way of saying it, which if you add up all that mileage, a full Ironman is 140.6 and then a half Ironman is 70.3. So okay. doing a half um, is, is a fun race. Um, I did my half Ironmans in about five hours. Um, and yeah, you would say 70.3 or 140.6. Gotcha. And, uh, Hey, so he's, there's a picture that I want to put, um, on the podcast of him. Uh, is it coming, you were coming through to the finish line or, yep. okay. Yeah. Yep. He looks like a totally different person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Super small, you know, but you were small. I mean, uh, small dude. And you, I think you have to be obviously if you're training that much, dude, like how you can't. So when you're training for that, do you ever get near any of those? Do you ever really, do you swim that far ever before you do it? I would say the typical training plan has you about maxed out at 85% of those total distances on each discipline. Mm -hmm. um, I remember cycling. Uh, so this would be a little bit more, but I remember cycling my first 100 mile, uh, you know, training mm -hmm. route and, I'd say that was a defining moment and there's a defining moment of each, each sport, but where you feel like, because I completed this training set, I know I can complete the, yeah the, the real, real deal. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I swam probably up to two miles, biked a hundred and ran up to maybe 22 miles. Yeah. Um, and, and then I got really dedicated into just the marathon portion um, and kind of shifted my focus to I won't call five for Boston. Mm -hmm. um, so I ran a two hour and 47 minute marathon and uh, that qualified me to the Boston marathon in 2020. Um, that Boston uh, year was canceled. Um, the next year and 2022, there were some restrictions that um, were just hoops that I didn't want to jump through. So I let my uh, exemption lapse. Um, so right now I'm in my training cycle to qualify for Boston again. Just the iconic marathon that it is, it's, it's something that I want to complete. Do you think that you have to be somewhat of a selfish person to be able to even do any of this sort of stuff because the amount of training that goes into this thing. I mean, do you ever get accused of that or do you, ever, you and your wife ever fight about this or, I mean, was ever like a situation because it, you know, it's, it's a lot, dude. Yeah. A lot of time away from whatever it is you got going on, um, to dedicate. It's almost like a job, dude. Yeah. Especially for the Ironman. 
I was 21 and not married yeah. uh, for Ironman. And the bulk of my training was when I was 20. Okay. Um, and you know, I was living in an apartment on my own, wake up super early, get my bike in, yeah. have a very normal day and then maybe yeah. squeeze in a one hour treadmill workout at night. You just have to be very, very diligent on the bookends of your day. Mm -hmm. Um, training for a complete Ironman right now, um, I think would be very challenging. <laughs> yeah. I have a six month old. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't do it. Um, you couldn't do it. Yeah. You can put a picture up of my six month old. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Priorities have changed a little bit, but, uh, yeah, for training for a marathon, um, the longest training for me, it will be on a Saturday and Sunday, which would max out at two yeah. hours. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the week will be 45 minute to one hour runs. So to me, that really just takes place of staying in shape. Yeah. Um, so it's not too burdensome. You know, you hear like the the whole David Goggins, you know, deal. And, you know, if you've read that book or listened to it. Yep. You know, he, he talks so much about like all what he did, you know, his mindset and how he can get through everything. And, you know, he run on broken feet and, mm -hmm. you know, just like everything that could go wrong with somebody. Also, you know, divorced twice maybe three yeah. times you know yeah. it's like you know you hear about and it is motivating and he's obviously an amazing freaking dude um but you give away a lot to become this guy that's why i kind of bring up the selfish side of things like i always think about like okay cool but like it's not everything's not just about yourself yep. especially when you have people in your life like yeah. a, like a spouse or you know and kids and all that sort of stuff so i don't know i i just spin that message sometimes when i hear everybody's so into it but it it is what it is you know that's him and he inspires a lot of people and and you know that that's kind of what keeps him going and, and i think he probably needed to because he was in a bad situation before he got really fit but the story is insane um it's <clears> a but, good topic though because i would say while it might look different from the outside looking in i'm more of a dabbler than I am a yeah. expert at one discipline, yeah. whether it be triathlon or marathon running. Those are two snapshots, but what I've also gravitated towards is golf and pickleball yeah. and yeah. Uh, a variety of things. And in, in playing more competitive pickleball, the conversation has been, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh. yeah, <laughs> you know, I play once a week. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and then same with golf. It's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll play, you know, with someone in the morning and then they'll be like, oh, are you practicing tonight? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm yeah. going and doing something yeah. else. Right. Um, and I, I, I also connect that to what we were talking about earlier, which is the difference between Canada and the U S um, that's so American to go all in. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> like I, I, I was on the golf team and did really, really well in British Columbia. Um, and, uh, we golfed and we played once a week as a team. Right. It was just fill in your training by yourself. <laughs> right. Here we'll have a structured, right. you know, I think it was Mondays or Tuesdays was men's golf practice day. And then when I came to Scott, so Christian, I was on the golf team and uh, we practiced on Monday and I asked the other players on the team, I'm like, oh, we practice on Mondays? And they were like, yeah. And then we, I was confused and they were like, we practice every day. Yeah. Every right. single day yeah. after school. We're yeah. on the bus. We go, yeah. to, we go to Moon Valley Country Club. Mm -hmm. We're there for three hours, Monday through Friday. Then we have our events. Then we have our tournaments. Then I'm playing in other junior circuits that I'm already on. Right. And it was just a world of a difference for me. So I'm not a type of person uh, that even though my real estate team is golf course homes, I love golf. I'm a student of the game. Yeah. I watch golf. Mm -hmm. I, I have a network there. I'm not playing multiple times a week. I'm yeah. also running. I'm also playing pickleball. So I'm a, I'm a dabbler and there's other people that just, dedicate their entire lives to it you know to the david goggins point it's yeah. it's they they make big sacrifices to get any competitive edge um in their one area of focus yeah i mean we can go on for days about 
use sports in the, <laughs> in the amount of time. It just, you know, uh, the only thing I could think of, in you know, obviously in Canada, hockey is that way. I mean, these kids yes. are playing every single day, all day long. That and is the one. Caveat. Yeah, that's the yeah. one thing. And yeah. and northern states in the United States, like Minnesota, <laughs> yeah. they actually passed it at my school that yeah. hockey could be a class. Yeah, and then you didn't have to take physical education, and then you could start earlier. <laughs> and then we switched our entire class structure to make the classes longer so that every other day they could have a four to five hour block of time during school hours just to play, just play hockey. hockey. Yeah. But I know probably a dozen people from my high school that play in the NHL. Really? Yes. Jeez. Yes. That's a lot. Fun fact, probably the arch enemy of the nhl riddled with issues and controversy but uh his name is evander kane mm -hmm. and uh he was my partner in one of my classes to uh my dismay because i had to do all of his work and where does he play we could look up the team that he's on right now but so he, he's in the nhl but he's like a bad guy he's a bad guy bad attitude <laughs> fighter yeah. bankruptcy oh, okay. issues yeah. yeah and i could have I could have told you that would all happen <laughs> right. when he was 15 years old. Yeah. He was one of those kids. Uh, but yeah. Okay. So, um, moving to like your career, right? So you graduate from college and you decide, you know, golf's your golf's career is, it's over. Yep. It's going to be your hobby now. Um, so did you go to school to be a financial advisor? Was it finance? Was it your major? Like how'd that go? My major is a financial planner, finance and economics. Okay. And then um, you have to get securities license. So yeah. I got my Series 7 broker's license. And then I did also get my Series 66, which allows me to do ongoing financial planning, both state and federally. Mm -hmm. um, and then I became a junior partner with my dad's advisor, someone that had really mentored me. That was kind of my home base internship. And then I got a lot of internships through growing the network through him. Um, and stayed on at that firm. He always made it clear that he wanted to grow his business once his son graduated from ASU. Mm -hmm. So his son graduated, they continued as planned, and then that was good timing for me to start my own firm. Um, so I started an independent financial planning firm, and my wife was actually the first one in the real estate industry that I was feeding a lot of referrals to. Okay. So fun fact for you, you don't know this, I did have my Series 7. Nice. Yes. Hard and test. 63. Hard test. And an eight, which is way, this is a long time ago. Very hard test. Yeah. Man, I studied for months, all day long, all night. Yeah. And I think I still only. Do you pass? Yeah. I First passed. time? Second time. Second time. Second time. Okay. I got a 73, I think. I think I was thinking 75 was passing. Yep. 75 is I think passing. I got a 73 or 74, and then I passed with a 77 oh, after right. studying for three months after I failed it the first time. Yeah. And I knew guys that were, that took it and I studied once, got like 90s. And I'm yep. like, what the heck? You yep. know, but that is a very, very difficult test. Oh, yeah. um, and it's six hours, like 600 questions, right? I mean, it, yep. it was, it's, it's brutal. But yeah, one of those Pearson testing centers with a yeah. pencil and a piece oh, yeah. of paper next to you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you started your own firm doing that. And how were you getting business right away? A lot of the business came from meeting people at dating back to all those original internships that I'd done. Mm -hmm. uh, one in particular was a great um, moment of networking, period of networking for me. Um, I was a uh, blogger for a uh, tech website it's okay. called AZ Tech Beat. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, an awesome software founder um, in town um, who's built and sold multiple companies. Um, started that publication because he thought tech news in Arizona was underreported on. And I was the, I was the first and only blogger for quite some time. Um, so that was a great hall pass because I didn't have anything to sell. I had something to give. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feature them. I wanted to go to their event. Um, you know, Infusionsoft is one of our big yeah. tech success stories. They were that's doing, like a Salesforce CRM yeah. platform sort of deal, right? Yeah. Are they still around? Like They are. They rebranded to the name Keep. Okay. K-E-A-P. Um, but um, they have a wonderful CEO, uh, Clayt Mask, and he would put on uh, an annual conference called InfusionCon. Thousands of people would come. And this was 
2011, 2012, 2013. Um, and so you were 22. I was 20, 20, um, training for Iron Man, And, uh, yeah, like I got a media pass. So yeah. I got to go to the events. I got to go back. Um, I remember vividly, you know, Damon John was the speaker one year and FUBU. Uh, oh, absolutely. For us, by us, baby. Yeah. So sitting back and <clears throat> chatting there, but through that, you know, reporting and um, writing for AZ Tech Beat, I met a lot of people in tech. It's actually how I met my business partner today. Um, Tanner German is my business partner, and uh, he started in the tech industry. And we met at um, a tech event downtown and stayed in touch. He became a client, and uh, then it was a good opportunity for us to join forces. In all your businesses or just the financial planning side? Both financial planning and real estate. Yep. It's a trick question. Yep. Um, so, and he's a young guy too. Yeah. So you guys must have, I mean, you guys look young now, so you yep. must have looked like, you, I mean, it's hard when you're trying to get money from somebody than you look when you look like you're 16 years old. It is. Um, you have to solve problems yeah. and you have to be a financial organizer. A lot of people have accounts scattered all over. They yeah. have an old 401k from a job they used to work at. So if you're willing to come in and just, do a little bit of that grunt work, right. organize their financial life. You know, it's, it's a bit of a lost leader to building trust. Yeah. And now that you know that I'm going to help you, that I can accomplish things that I'm coming back to you with updates of what's been done. Um, there's movement there. Do you still do that? I do. Okay. Yep. I think that that is like a lost art, you know, it's like, especially for people getting in the business, it's, everybody needs somebody to help them budget. Yeah. Figure out where their bills are going. Who's how's what's on an auto pay. What's not, you know, yep. how much money they're making versus how much money they're spending. Um, it's a good little in. So are you bringing, do you bring people into work for your guys's company or is it just you and Tanner? On the like, financial you, planning yeah, side. Yeah. Uh, right now it's just us and support staff. Okay. Um, we would consider it. Um, I would love to do the same for someone else um, that Mark, my prior business partner, did for me. Mm -hmm. Bring on a junior advisor, give them a book of business, give them a leg up, but you know, give them the tools so that they can expand and really grow. You know, a lifetime career. Um, the thing that ho keeps me in the business is these are amazing relationships and I'm going to talk to these people for the rest of their lives, no matter what. Yeah. Um, and they're going to come to me with, you know, questions no matter what. Um, so I would love to do that. Um, and then on the real estate side, we have grown faster in terms of team headcount. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Do you guys have, do you, do you go out and find agents? I know we talked about this before, like you're not really into like pulling people from within North and Co, but you guys have added people as you go. Yep. Are they people that have just like friends or did they come to you or did you just find them? And you think, okay, this person looks like they'd be good at this. Yeah. Um, a lot of them have come from referrals where okay. we've been set up on blind dates. Gotcha. Um, I love that. I love chatting with agents. Um, I think it's a, good offering if someone that is in the real estate industry wants to align their career with something they're passionate about, if they're also passionate about golf. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also a way that you can stand out in marketing because we're marketing where the competition isn't. Yeah. Um, like I said, I was at a professional golf tournament today and I went where, there by the way, at talking stick right now. Really? What's, yeah. what is it? It's the desert financial open. Is that a senior tour of the champions or is it? It's put on by uh, the Gateway Golf Tour, okay. but it's a okay. mini tour. Got yep. you, mini tour deal. Yep. Okay. Um, but all these guys are former PGA Tour players. Or about to be. About to be. <laughs> yeah. The guys that are playing on Corn Ferry. Yeah. Uh, playing in PGA Tour Latin America or PGA Tour Canada. Right. I mean, they have. They're to, all amazing golfers. They have to put together a schedule. I mean, the last time I checked the leaderboard, it was a former tour player, Charlie Belgian, that, you know, shot 64 yesterday and then Jeez. you know today's round two um tomorrow's the final round but i mean the the, the winner is going to be putting out some serious golf mm -hmm. um i think it's 125,000 total purse prize okay. so that's not to winner that's divided out yeah, by yeah, yeah. you know everyone so maybe winners taking home a third of that 
Yeah. Um, but you're grinding, you're prepping. It's not just playing those three days. It's you're playing in the pro am. You're playing the practice rounds. Right. You're 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 traveling there. Um, so what brought you there today? Did you have clients there or? I had someone that um, has given us real estate referrals and is a friend um, there playing that I wanted to support. And then someone in his group that um, I I knew people that used to uh, play on the ASU golf team mm-hmm. or currently play on the ASU golf team. And he right. was a he's a former ASU player. So okay. I went up into him and introduced myself. We've also done real estate deals for um, you know, people that are connected to the ASU golf team. So we had some commonality and, uh, yeah, it was, uh, so that's a perfect example of, you know, I went to an event that is seemingly very right. unrelated to buying and selling real estate Yeah, and, um, you know, walked out with someone to follow up with. Right. Yeah. So What made you decide to go and do the real estate side of things when you were already doing the financial advising side? Yeah. Um, Obviously your wife was into it, but you know, it's like, was it because like, Hey, I can make some money here too, or this is just a good opportunity for my clients or what? Yeah. It really came down to, uh, I started giving so many referrals to Ashley that the clients still wanted to talk to me or they're updating me on the process of right, buying right. or selling. Um, and I said, I really should be licensed. And, uh, I also just really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Fell in love with the process. Um, I think there's defining moments in people's lives and deciding where they want to live. If they want to sell, if they want to buy something as an investment, um, if they're a visionary, um, and then same with cross agents with, I fell in love with, you know, those defining moment phone calls of negotiating or bridging a gap or finding a way to create a deal or keep a deal alive um, when it's, you know, seemingly going the other way. So I would say that's my uh, my real estate superpower would be keeping deals alive and keeping yeah. things moving forward. Do you have one you like better than the other? It's, it's, it's real I estate. Do. I do. <laughs> it's yeah. real estate. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. so much fun. I, I mean, we have a uh, relationship. We sponsor what's called the world putting tour at putting world. Putting world is an 18 hole championship indoor mini golf. Yeah. But there's no clowns. There's no windmills. It is like as professional golf as it can be. Mm-hmm. Every hole is a part two uh 18 hole putting course and they have a amazing restaurant and bar they brought the head chef over from silver leaf it's incredible and it's become our home away from home yeah um like i said we sponsor their world putting tour they have a monthly tournament thirty thousand dollar purse ten thousand going to the winner Jeez. and in december which will be an annual uh world putting tour championship in December, that purse is jumping up to a hundred thousand, with thirty thousand going to the winner for just four rounds of mini right. golf. So there's some people in there that take it very seriously, but you can also go in there and have a couple beers while yeah. you're putting. It's a really really fun time, and that has just been a great environment for us to be meeting with agents that are inquiring about joining the team, going there and doing a little bit of work, yeah. doing a little bit of putting. Um, even going there to dinner with, with clients and, you know, our spouses. So it's been a yeah. lot of fun. So how does it work then? So is it kind of like mini golf and the fact that like you start and then like five minutes late, five minutes later, the team, like the next foursome's going or like, how does it work like that? So right now there aren't jam packed where okay. they it's, need designated tea times, Okay, but they're about to launch some incredible technology where if we were playing, it would say Ryan is up on the tee. If you make the putt, it would actually through kind of like a light camera from Mm -hmm. above, draw the line on the putting green as to how your ball went from the tee box all the way into the hole. Um, So there's some really cool golf tech that's coming out and then it would record your score Mm -hmm. as you birdied that is you made a one. Right. Um, and then I would be up to play. So basically the technology that Top Golf has on the yeah. screens, they're implementing in for putting. 
Um, and you know, ping also has a, a, a pretty big presence at putting world. So there's ping putters, there's a lot of technology, yeah. you can get fit, you can get lessons. Um, so it's, it's expanding, but right now is a really good time to check it out because it's, um, it's not big it's, yet. It's not, you know, jam packed. Yeah. yeah. Is it, is that the only one? It's the only one and okay. they want so who, to, who is who's behind this i feel like you know them yes okay I do. <laughs> okay. okay uh it's a, it's a group of guys here locally it okay. was a former office max yeah. um so tim the ceo was driving by one day saw it as an office max building it's in between lowe's and PetSmart, mm -hmm. and he said wow it would be awesome to have an indoor putting course right there it's across the street from tpc scottsdale literally 250,000 yeah. people are going to walk right by it every single year. Yeah. Um, and, uh, he, he built it out. Um, paying is, is, is a big, uh, contributor to it. Um, but the vision has come to life and his goal is to, uh, have 25 across the country. And, and I believe, you know, you know, first, you heard it here first. The next location will be uh, Las Breaking Vegas. Breaking news, Las Vegas. Yeah. Well, you think like, is there anything else in there, like simulators or anything like that? Or is that, is that ever They decided go? against simulators okay. for two good reasons. They wanted to keep it putting. Yeah. They wanted to keep a rule that the ball must remain on the ground. Yeah. Okay. They don't want yeah. people chipping. And simulators are actually kind of loud. Yeah, they are. Um, and you're playing music, you're putting you know and, yeah. and and they also wanted to keep it you know between you and me as a business guy yeah it's a restaurant right you right. know they're that's they're, where they make their real money they're right they're there the to, to sell food and drink <laughs> yeah so if you're there for a really nice restaurant and i'm we're talking crispy rice with ahi tuna and oh, okay. you know like it's, so it's good food it's an elevated menu right it's not bar food um and and a cocktail if you're sitting at the bar having a drink and and that appetizer you don't necessarily want to hear someone cranking drivers right. yeah 20 feet from you yeah so. well i'm gonna go there <laughs> i yeah. think this weekend yeah so there's a trevor's that just opened up too yeah that's kind of a cool little spot i, I think these you know, with all these big boxes going out of business, right? They're trying to fill things in. I just saw an article the other day that, like, you know, the pickleball courts are being put in all kinds of places. Yeah. And I was thinking about it like a year ago, the Burlington Co Factory over yeah. here off Indian Bend. I'm like, man, this would be a great spot for pickleball courts. And I don't have any <laughs> connection with this company. Uh, I obviously have a connection with Putting World, but yeah. um, I don't have a connection with Chicken and Pickle. Yeah, but which is going up right over here. You can see their model. Yeah, exactly. Is they're, they're selling food and they're yeah. putting in pickleball courts. Right. So speaking of pickleball courts and pickleball, you started playing pickleball about three years ago too? Yep. So... You're all, we don't need to go how deep into that too, but you're obviously way into that as well. And you yep. went hardcore through in COVID and you got really good. Again, you were playing more then, yes. but now you're like a once a weeker guy maybe, right? Yep. Um, so I think when getting back to, like you said, mindset earlier, it's like when you think about, because I've, I've played with you enough to know that like you think, it's not just like a physical sport <laughs> for you. Like you're thinking ahead. It's such like a, like an IQ thing, right? And yeah. so is golf. I mean, like totally. you can tell somebody who's got like a really good golf IQ because they're going to be like, oh, well, you're on this spot in the trap. You should 70% of your weight should be on your front foot. We're going to bring it back. We're going to break your wrist here. 99.9% .9 of people don't think that far into every shot yep. and all the things in their weight and all that stuff. But when we were playing pickleball, you know, you were like suggesting things to me. Yep. Of, but when they do this or I'm already anticipate this because of this, did that come from like just you playing a lot and learning or did you like, are you one of those guys that dives into it and gets on YouTube and like, all right, I'm going to learn as much as I can about this sport. Is that how you do everything? Uh, I'm actually not very analytical. Really? So I don't dive into the charts, the spreadsheets, the YouTube videos. Yeah. Um, I think probably golf gave me a little bit of an advantage, but um, in golf, you know, it's becoming popular now, but they call it swing your swing. Mm -hmm. You know, golf, when I grew up, they, what does that mean? Uh, don't change your swing. If okay. you do something funky, just, just do it. Learn how to make it yeah. optimal. 
Um, when I was growing up, there was what's called plane one and plane two swings. You know, plane one was Colin Montgomery going high and yeah. then coming low. And then plane two was the ideal perfect swing, just Tiger Woods on yeah. that perfect 45 degree angle or whatever angle yeah. it is. Um, and, you know, so I'm actually less into the technique. So it's not about where's your wrist, right. are you hitting this shot, are you hitting it perfectly? Um, there's probably a lot of points in my golf swing and in my pickleball swing or approach that isn't technically perfect, but I think about more so the outcome. Mm -hmm. So I read a book once called golf is a game of misses. It's, Hey, don't think about hitting it perfectly to the pin. Take a, take a look at your surroundings and say, okay, a bunker is here. Water is here. My optimal target is the pin, but where should I aim? So yeah. that if I miss it a little bit left, right, short, or long, all of those options are better. Yeah. That might be 30 feet right of the pin. Right. But, oh, if I pull it a little bit left and I hit it two feet from the pin, I look like a genius. Right, right, right. Or if I hit it exactly where I wanted to and I have a 30-foot putt for birdie, well, that's a great yeah. outcome. So my approach to pickleball is is – very much like that. I'm I'm less concerned about my game, how I'm hitting the ball, and I'm more trying to pick up that person has a weak backhand, that person doesn't come to the middle of the court, right. that person doesn't run up to the line fast enough, and then you just yeah you you, you lean into those right. weaknesses into their weaknesses yeah. <laughs> and try and uh, yeah yeah go for it. So do you, okay, so when you started doing, we're going to pivot into the real estate side of things because that's obviously how we know each other. Um, so how long did it take for you guys to start being successful in this business? Because, you know, I heard something funny the other day when you guys got the awards and Nick Patak said, like, somewhere along, I think you beat him by like one position. And yeah. he's like, cool, dude, your second job. Yeah. You did best. So you beat me in your second job, not your first job. Like, you're right. And this is, this is all I do. So, uh, which is kind of funny, right? And so you've obviously had a ton of success. You're showing up on the leaderboard all the time um, as as your like team and individually. So kind of walk us through, like how did that go? Like how long did it take for you to go for you guys to get that successful? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think I have a precise answer for it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the financial planning firm is, of course, a bit of a competitive advantage because yeah. we have – um, visibility into people's lives and right. they're coming to us long before the home buying moment of time, you know? Um, and I think that's the dilemma with most agents is when people are just casually looking on Zillow or maybe they ask a lender or maybe they text another friend yeah. in the industry, at what point does it go from casual to serious? And is the real estate agent there for that moment? What I've, found is that it goes from casual to serious very quickly mm -hmm. um and right, right. there isn't a long thought out process mm -hmm. um it's hey we're thinking about selling our home and <laughs> right. then you know and they accidentally go drive around and find a house yeah. they're like i'm buying this one i want to sell this one yeah we're yeah. doing it yeah we're doing um it. so uh i would say i found success by trying to solve problems like i talked about in financial mm -hmm. planning hey we're going to organize things for you yep. you got a bunch of old dusty accounts and we're going to clean them all up bring them to one place and mm -hmm. give you a plan um same thing in real estate is is kind of give me a task um and and sometimes i can try and help them um you know iterate on what it is that they want to accomplish yeah. hey ryan if we can find you a golf course condo at Greyhawk under 750 grand, three bed, two bath that you could also rent out to vacation rentals. Yeah. You know, would you potentially be interested in that? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Now that's something that, you know, is it goes on my my maybe list mm -hmm. and, you know, let's go and try and find that for Ryan or keep it in the back of our minds or call someone that we know that does a lot of deals in Greyhawk and see if they yeah. have something off market for Ryan. So, I don't really see myself as stepping into the real estate industry and saying, how do I do everything that every other real estate agent's doing? How do I start this business? How do I become successful at it as a whole? I kind of treated the real estate portion of my world 
as um, kind of like individual assignments. Okay. Um, yeah. As, you know, I need to right. complete the mission for this client. Right. And then that started snowballing. And I don't tend to subscribe to the same viewpoints of real estate coaching or um, goal setting in real estate around how many contacts or emails or postcards or phone calls. It actually kind of stresses me out. Right. And yeah. I'm like, well, I yeah. can't tell you precisely mm -hmm. what home I'm going to sell in six months. Right. But, um, it's funny because I would have never guessed that you're not analytical, Yeah. but you are kind of just like cruising through and it's just like, I mean, it's not easy, but it's, you're not like, you know, dialing 100 calls a day and you're not, no. like you said, doing all the things that like your coach to do typically as, a, as, as an agent or even a lender, right? Um, it's I'm just kind of like a, it's kind of like a, just a value add to your other business. Do you, do you have any idea what percentage of your other, of the financial business has stemmed to homes? I mean, is it like 50% of the deals you guys do come from your, from the, both places? In the early years, it was a majority of our real estate deals came from financial planning. Yeah. I would say in COVID, it started to level out to be 50-50. And now we're much moving into, yeah. we have built a you know significant real estate referral network yeah. and, and, and other people. Um, so it's becoming internal to real estate. But um, yeah, I would say on the analytical point is I'm not, into the spreadsheets and the YouTube videos every day, but I am very diligent about, um, I use notion. It's a software that I use it for my to-do list, saving a bunch of different information. Um, uh, we it's also like a Trello work. It's like a work, yeah. workplace, whatever. Yeah. Very simple, Projects very lightweight. Yeah. Um, we actually have, what's it called? Notion? notion. Notion. Yep. Um, so it's, it's a to-do list. There's, other ideas that I save in there. And we actually built an internal real estate CRM right into notion. So okay. for me, it's, it's, it's not so much about, you know, analytical for analytical sake. It's about what are you going to actually use yeah. daily? Um, so, um, I'm very diligent on keeping notes on keeping tasks on right. following up right. on, you know, doing that. And you're the guy that clears their email every day. Yeah, inbox zero. <laughs> inbox zero, which is very difficult to do. Very difficult. <laughs> you have another email account, though, that does not, that is not that way, because there's no way if you have a Gmail account that you can clear that every day. I don't do it every <laughs> okay. day, but I do it every week across wow. every email, four email addresses. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's virtually, that's a lot of work. But if yeah. you actually stay on it, I mean, I, after we get done here, I'm probably going to have 150 emails, and maybe yeah. five mean something to me. Well, that's first step in inbox zero is mass unsubscribe. Yeah. So, so you got to get rid of the ones that don't matter. <laughs> right. So you need, a, you need like the, the software or the app that will unroll everything yeah. or do you go do it your, individually? I ran it through that once before, but now they're so rare that yeah. when they come in, I just take okay. that extra second yeah. to unsubscribe. Okay. I need to do that so bad. And, and depends how hardcore you want to be or if you have a relationship with the sender but you also can just report it as spam yeah then it forever goes into your spam box but that hurts their email marketing metrics their mailchimp account yeah so if right. you actually know them you don't yeah. want to get right, a text right, saying, right right yo bro you mark, mark me as spam right so do you guys do any marketing for the the website for your business or do you guys have like an do you do seo or is it all relationship driven at this point Tanner is very technically proficient, so okay. he built our website. So check it out. Send the feedback to him. Okay. Golfcoursehomes.com. Tanner built it, but it's beautiful. We'll put the link up. Perfect. Um, and uh, uh, so, so he manages doing, that. So that's a little bit of his side. He's doing the site. He's doing SEO. Our name is super generic, so we have to climb an uphill battle for SEO purposes. Yeah. But he's fully handling that. Um, and then, you know, we're, we got, we got to be product to the product, but, uh, we just started our social media presence. So I, we have, uh, I don't think I've seen a social media post from you at exactly. all. Ever. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, yeah. yeah, stealth wealth, just hide in the stealth wealth. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's been the uh, approach so far. But uh, uh, at golf course homes on Instagram and TikTok, so we got those handles. Yeah, thankfully. Yeah, that's shocking that you even got that handle and that you got that website. Yep. Uh, you know, Another link. topic, if you potentially want to go there, is domain names. I <laughs> domain I, names. I love domain names. <laughs> oh so. yeah, you're a big domain guy. You just buy everything. Big domainer. <laughs> big domainer. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we we got social media going. Yeah. Um, we'll start doing more. But the the ultimate vision is golfcoursehomes.com becomes a media company, and okay. if we partner with golf courses and shoot a flyover video mm-hmm. and publish their membership offering and publish their overseed schedule for when their course is shut down and, uh, you know, potentially partner with them in a variety of different ways, hosting charity tournaments, hosting junior clinics, yeah. et cetera. We are just omnipresent around golf mm-hmm. and back to how people want to be sold. And the one thing that I just love about Arizona is you can walk in anywhere, just like I went to a golf tournament or at Isabella's kitchen or, at any event and start talking about real estate and everyone has a connection to real estate. Yeah. They want to talk about their primary house. They want to yeah. talk about their Airbnb. They want to talk mm-hmm. about someone they know in the business. Right. It's, <laughs> it's such an easy conversation yeah. to have. So I'm less worried about, Oh, we need to sit down with John and Mary and ask them if they want to list their house in Troon. I'll just hold the Troon wine night at the golf course. Right. And if we're, if we become omnipresent in the top 100 courses of Arizona as golf course homes, oh, yeah. I've seen that name. Oh, we got your golf towel and yeah. your gift basket because we attended your tournament. My son went to your junior clinic and now he's great at chipping and putting. You know, we see that as our bigger opportunity. Yeah. And that's out to everyone that's also attracting other agents that want to join our team we want to consistently grow in arizona we want to dominate arizona before we go or think about any other states there's golf in a bunch of other states but we're in one of the best if not the best so um let's become the premier real estate team for anyone that is buying or selling into a golf course community your home backyard doesn't need to be right on the course right but if you are in the gates at Greyhawk at Silverleaf at Whisper Rock there is a part of your home's value that is connected to golf yeah that home can't sell for the ultimate price and let is unless it's represented in a way where you know about the membership you know the course you know the architect how it's designed what the membership culture is like. Yeah. You know, God, we, you need to, you need to meet Noah. After we get done here, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to get us on a group text. The guy that owns, um, Epic golf, the Epic golf club. Yep. That'd be great. Because he's basically saying the same shit. <laughs> like, yeah. If you don't, it's a, it's a good, if you don't like, yeah. you know, air Jordan backwards mm-hmm. hats and loud yeah. music when you're playing golf, don't become a member at Silver League. Yeah, exactly. That wasn't the story. Yeah. Go to Desert Mountain. <laughs> that wasn't the story five yeah. years ago right. before Ben Herman bought it. Right. But now that it's under new ownership, you know, that's. <laughs> Dude, it's crazy. You walk into the, I had lunch there and you're walking into the freaking restaurant and there's like girls in like bikinis oh, yeah. having drinks. And, and like you can wear like no shirt like yep. out playing golf and like yep. dude it's just it's a whole it's, it's like you know the prisoners took over the prison yes. <laughs> and they just run that place it's yep. it's amazing mm-hmm. so I'll, i'm gonna set you up with with no at least you guys should know each other for sure because you got a lot of similarities in this um again na- let's, uh, say the website golfcoursehomes.com golfcoursehomes.com I think this is a good way to segue out of this because I think you just did a great commercial for your business. <laughs> uh, so again, th- thanks for coming. Reed Simpson, uh, he's with North and Co, but he's with but he's with GolfCourseHomes.com, um, and he is uh, an uber talented guy doing a lot of crazy stuff. So if you ever want to meet this guy and pick his brain, I think he's a he, he's not intimidating. He's just a little bit better than us at everything. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, all right, everybody. So thank you for uh, for listening to another episode. Obviously, go on YouTube and like and subscribe. 
uh, all the social media platforms, please go on, comment, like, share with all your friends um, into the storm. And uh, thank you, Trey. Thank you to VIP Mortgage for uh, allowing us to be in this building and to Bison Ventures yes. uh, for uh, having this podcast room. We are a mortgage company and uh, we are a separate mortgage company from VIP Mortgage, but under the umbrella. We had that conversation earlier. So thank you, everybody, and uh, take care. See you next time.